This program is brought to you by SoundsTrue.com. At SoundsTrue.com, you can find hundreds of downloadable audio learning programs, plus books, music, videos, and online courses and events. At SoundsTrue.com, we think of ourselves as a trusted partner on the spiritual journey, offering diverse, in-depth, and life-changing wisdom. SoundsTrue.com. Many voices, one journey. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today my guest is Alanis Morissette. Alanis is a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter, guitarist, record producer, and actress who has sold more than 60 million albums worldwide. Alanis was honored with the EMA Missions in Music Award for her efforts in speaking out against drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Alanis Morissette has been acting on her strong beliefs for years and encourages her fans and listeners to do the same. Alanis is also someone who has a deep interest in personal transformation and someone I feel so happy to be able to call a friend to Sounds True. With Sounds True, Alanis will be speaking at the 2015 Wake Up San Francisco event along with Adyashanti, Sarah Beek, Carolyn Mace, Mario Martinez, and many more. That's March 28th, 2015. This episode of Insights at the Edge was recorded live at the 2013 Emerging Women Live National Event. Emerging Women supports women interested in creating a new paradigm for success through feminine leadership and entrepreneurship. For more information, you can visit www.emergingwomen.com. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, Alanis and I spoke about working with fear and finding what she calls the nuggets of terror in her own journal writing and how these can become seeds in the creative process. We talked about her relationship with a movement that's called Relationship First and why she places such a high value on being encircled by loving relationships. We talked about what it might mean to have a ceilingless conversation and Alanis's view of the evolution of the feminist movement and that what's needed next is something that she calls sacred union. Here's my conversation recorded at Emerging Women Live with Alanis Morissette. I want to thank Tammy for being up here with me and having a conversation with me. It's my favorite thing to do, as my friends can attest to, is dialogue and go back and forth and see what's actually happening in real time with you and with us. We get to make our love public. Exactly. (laughs) There's nothing better than that. Exactly. (laughs) Making our love public. Okay. The primacy of connection. I want to start right there. Let's go for the jugular. With us being, well, the, well, the jugular is going to come later. Oh, there are, there are so many jugulars, right, so, exactly. little, so little time. Yeah. That's part of why I'm but happier here. Your, your journey mm-hmm. to connection mm-hmm. being, at least in my understanding, the most important thing for you in your life. How did mm. you get there? I didn't get there. I think I started there. Huh. And um, I'm a highly sensitive temperament. I'm, I've become more and more obsessed with self-knowledge because I've seen how empowering it is and how it enables me to actually have functional intimacy with people. So I'm the girl that uses every tool of divination and wants to know what number I am on the Enneagram and wants to know, you know, I throw my chin coins and I basically have wanted to connect with God and intrapersonally with my own self and with people my whole life and to the point where because of my hypersensitivity when it doesn't happen in glimpses throughout the day at grocery stores or wherever I am it's actually quite devastating for me Mm. and I take responsibility for it in that I don't get upset at the woman who looks away when she's trying to buy her watermelons but um (laughs) but I but I hurt (laughs) so um 
I don't know if that answers your question. Are there, are there things that you do to invite or to magnetize to you the kind of connection that as a sensitive person really nourishes you? Is there something, stuff that you do, what, and what is it? Um, I think it happens by default. You know, I, I find that wh whatever energy I walk into a room with, the kismet like-minded find each other eventually, and it doesn't always happen. And sometimes I just, people watch as a Canadian culturally, I think. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah! Um, we're, you know, I'm going to do the broad stroke, which is a terribly violent thing to do, but I'll do it anyway. Canadians are very um, conversational, dialogical, and really great at people watching. We also snap when we're pushed too far, <laughs> which has served my art, but not necessarily my personal life. Um, um, so I don't even know if that answers your question, sorry, Sammy. Uh, but you just asked if yeah. what I do to foster yeah. the connection yeah. or, okay, fostering connection. I mean, what you've learned over the last decade as you've been able to, it's a strong statement to mm -hmm. say connection is the primary mm. uh, feel that I'm looking yes. for in life. That's a strong statement. Yeah. And so I wonder how you orient around that in order to receive that type of nourishment and to make that type of bond with people. Thanks, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual idea for me because I've always felt profoundly connected with God, and I know that word is... I like that word, it's fine with me. You like the word? Okay, good. I mean, we can substitute a bunch of other words. There's so but, many beautiful but, words, but, let's yeah, just use God. Yeah. So I've always been... Uh, <laughs> I've always loved God so much. Yeah. And um, raised Catholic. And even within a lot of that intensity, I still found God. You know, I found God in Jesus. I found God in a lot of the parables. I found God everywhere in the music. That was the first time I actually knew that I could sing. Someone turned around. I think I was 10 years old, and I was singing at the top of my lungs the St. Francis of Assisi song. Mm. And my brothers had told me I couldn't sing to save my mm. life, which I believed, because they're my brothers. And then this woman turned around, and she said, you have a lovely voice. Mm. Mm. Really? <laughs> Thanks. So that was a turning point. Um, but I think because I know that I know on a very cellular existential level how connected I am with everything and everyone, when there is this illusion of separation, it kills me. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I've heard you talk about connection in terms of connection to yourself, connection to other people, and also connection to spirit. Mm. but that in your experience, it's actually one thing, kind of. Mm. Can you explain what you mean by that? How is it kind of one thing? Well, I think why the idea of a relationship is so enticing to me is that it speaks to what I believe is the fundamental truth of what's actually going on here, which is, you know, I know I'm not telling you anything. That no, I want you, you to don't tell me what's know, actually but I will going tell on you. here. Please oh, tell really? me okay. what's actually <laughs> going on here. Yeah. Okay, good. Tell, tell all of us. <laughs> exactly. Okay, great. Um, I just really feel this, this, um, this profound interconnectivity, for lack of a better term. So I was going to answer... How it's all one thing. How it's all one thing. All of these, these three kinds of connection. Uh, it's that we're all one fabric. These, in my mind, there, we're all these unique filters. Yeah. This transmission or source or God or inspiration or intuition is coursing through us yeah. in what I believe is in various speeds. I think some of us have energy coursing through us in a way that's overwhelming. I think of Jimi Hendrix, and I just think he had so much energy coursing through him, and I'm not sure he had a way to calibrate it. I yeah. don't know. I didn't talk with him. Yeah. But, but you, you have quite a bit of energy coursing yeah, and through it's, you. I yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, and, and I have to be responsible with it and for it, to be honest, because it can be overwhelming in relationships. I can be quite a bother to people because this is the energy that I walk into a room with, and it, and it can be overwhelming for people. Um, it can be exciting for people. It's exciting for my husband. It was horrifying for all my ex-boyfriends, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is true. <laughs> And for a long time, I shamed myself, saying that there was something wrong with me, that I was too much, or I was too intense, or I was too emotional, or I was too sensitive, or fill in the blank. And that's all true. <laughs> but, um, but it really just meant that there was a 
lens that I was looking through at this funny and harrowing and sweet little life that um, that I was looking for compatibility. I write about it in All I Really Want, which Chantal referenced, and the idea of wanting to have that cosmic giggle with people, you know, to look at people I love and just say, isn't it crazy being here? Isn't it intense? Isn't it so sad that our traumas have us completely check out of our bodies and check out of our relationships and do drugs and we're dying to crawl back into the womb and we can't and you know I just love having those kinds of conversations with people <laughs> and um, and I actually have them now with yeah. you as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you Tammy yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now you're talking about your current man and your ex-boyfriends and mm. you've made this statement I declare I am an alpha woman <clears throat> yes I and have. that this was a, an important uh, claiming mm. alpha woman it's a strong strong two words to put together like that what, what do you yeah. mean by it um, I mean that I have masculine qualities and that I'm I err on the side maybe not always aesthetically although sometimes I err on the side of really enjoying androgyny I love the idea of having access to the whole range of what it is to be human while taking into account that physiologically, biochemically, I am a woman. So I get to have all the amazing aspects of being a woman, and there are so many. I mean, my shoes alone are reason enough to want to be a woman. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, so maybe just lift your foot a little bit so we can get a good, people can get a good look at that. <laughs> Um, I like mine also, They're quite, <laughs> they have their own sort of androgyny yeah. as well. Yeah, it's a lambin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, so and androgyny's been great. <laughs> and I, um, so uh, I've actually updated the alpha woman comment because I, I think a lot of people, mostly men, were a little freaked out when I would say that because I think they may have been interpreted as my saying I want to be the man in this man-woman gender conversation. So at first I attempted to take this conversation out of gender and take it into the feminine and the masculine and that continued to piss people off. So now I basically say yin and yang. That okay. pisses a lot less people off. So how do you translate then the alpha woman phrase into yin, yang language? Right? I can be quite yang. And that would mean, in theory, that if there is to be some sort of compliment in my marriage in this right. case, that there's a lot of negotiation. There are moments where I'll jump in the car and I'll go, you got this. Or we'll be driving and I'll stop the car and I'll say, you're driving. And I'll go, got it. You know, or we'll be leaving. You know, we just we're constantly negotiating who's going to be the yin or the yang person of the moment, depending upon our stress levels, PMS. There's all kinds of considerations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In the Shakti Woman book, I, forgive me for not knowing the authors. There's there's this one uh, paragraph where they talked about how in this particular village in the days of old the village people would seek out the women who were PMSing in order to have them make decisions about the village because they were at, in the perfect place to have an opinion without worrying about mincing words. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I love this book. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so um, and I think ultimately, and I talked about this briefly last night at the get-together that we had um, with somebody the idea of, for a long time, this whole emergence of the divine feminine being a huge conversation, and, and at long last, obviously. Um, my whole thought about the yin-yang androgyny whole continuum, I, I think in terms of continuums all the time. And so the whole idea in my mind at this point, and I might update this next month, but who cares? Um, Even tomorrow would be Whatever, okay. in fine. an hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that the masculine and the feminine energies within both men and women alike are serving the feminine. So it's not that men have to debase or emasculate themselves or be emasculated, although of course there's rage and anger, as there should be. There's been so much oppression, and not only do we feel it in our own lives in the context of patriarchy, we also feel it in the context of our grandmothers and great-grandmothers. and you know. So when women are angry and they're scared of emasculating, 
I get it. Just make some arrangement with your man where he can hold the bucket for 20 minutes and just listen to your rage and hopefully not personalize it singularly about him because we're all subject to the context that we find ourselves in and, and patriarchy is still alive and well in the rock and roll business. I'm assuming in the book world, I'm about to find out, I'm writing a book. Um, in, in a lot of contexts that I go in, it's still there. Totally shifting, which is the great news. Um, and I think what I'm excited about so much these days is supporting the divine masculine to continue to provide and to continue to protect, but that the currency of the provision has changed. So instead of just bringing home the vegan bacon, <laughs> they're also, they're also they're providing empathy and listening and all of these things that they're actually not physiologically predisposed to being able to do well and that we're teaching each other how to do it. If, if someone ha doesn't have the capacity to empathize, there's probably a trauma somewhere in the background that happened that made it so that, you know, not unlike when someone steps on your toe, the first thing you say isn't usually like, is your shoe okay? It's usually, get the fuck off my foot, are you killing me? You know? yeah. So when we're traumatized, we don't always have that generosity of spirit, which I believe is what men are known for. They're men, men in my mind are known for providing and protecting and that that currency is broadening and becoming larger and larger, and that the masculine within us as women, because you and I are pretty protective of the people we love and in general, um, that these qualities of masculinity and femininity can show up not only in both genders, but in different contexts, case by case, depending upon what you need to call upon. Yeah. Now, you talked about the music business and the publishing business. I'm curious, let's just go right into the music okay. business, okay. because... <laughs> As an artist, you are also, in a sense, a businesswoman. Yes. Yeah? I mean, yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah. But just by being part of the music industry. Yeah. So what would this, putting at the center of the music business, the sacred feminine, mm. what, what would that look like? I mean, what, the little bit I know of the music business, it seems that it's a difficult <clears throat> and um, uh, business that doesn't usually support artists fully yeah. in the way that they want. You know, so, so what would it mean to put the sacred feminine, your, your uh, divine feminine, at the center of the music industry as an example <clears throat> of the transformation of society? But let's take that industry. Nice. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I think that what's happening even in today's day is that there's this... Uh, the values of the West, which ultimately is basically the planet almost at this point, um, if not entirely. Fame, wealth and staying 16 forever, <laughs> visually. So when I look at what's on stage right now, I also see young women who are not in a position of wanting to be responsible for being a model to the millions of people and to leading the charge and leading the cavalry home to divine union. So they're experimenting with their sexuality in a context, certainly of North America, probably more so even the rest of the planet as well, of sexual trauma. We're a sexually traumatized culture in my mind. And when I'm 17 or 19, and I have the kind of body that society approves of, and I don't have to name names, we just have to look at pop culture right now and everybody's doing it. <laughs> so I feel like it's a response to this pornographic, sexually traumatized culture that we live in, and that that has now become the definition of what the divine feminine is. That there's, that there's a conversation around and the empowered feminine being singular in our sexuality acting out or just being sexual. So I think what to answer your question about what the, the divine feminine might look like in the epicenter of, of what is a bit of a shitstorm sometimes, which yeah. is the music industry, yeah. it's, to, it's to play with the whole range. That in, in, a, in a moment where I'm in a conf on a conference call with 25 people and it's appropriate for me to set a boundary, I'll set it, risking that I'll be called a bitch. If, there, if I'm in a deposition, which I was in, and I start crying because it's too much for me, that's my divine feminine coming through. That's, you know, so, so for me to be as authentic as possible in every moment while being responsible for being politically considerate and, you know, I'm not... You're Canadian after I'm all. I'm Canadian. Yeah. Um, and I, I like social grace. I yeah. actually think there's something to be said for social grace and yeah. etiquette and manners and... 
Um, and then there's also something to be said for setting boundaries. And, but I, I think if there's anything that I would want to offer to not only the industry, I'd be audacious to say, but, but to any young woman who's in the epicenter of the eye of the storm of fame right now, it's that, it's just let that sexuality, the healthy and maybe even the unhealthy version, because it's all out there, um, integrate it. You know, let the spirit and the brain and the somatic and the body and the fear and the feelings and the rage and the authenticity and the connectivity and the pain of disconnection and, and your sexuality and the breakup and the drama and the so no drama, so boring. <laughs> let it all combine together and then write. You know, mm. um, it would change, it would turn the industry on its ass, I think. But then what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is the music industry evidencing what's going on in our consciousness or is our consciousness dictating what we want to see on MTV? Probably both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about how you have, and you use this word, and I think it's a powerful word, an imperative to create as a person, mm -hmm. that there's something in you that's an imperative. Can, so talk about that, what that feels like inside you, this imperative. Yeah, if I'm not expressed, uh, I'm very depressed, basically. So are there sort of two, is there the expressed, depressed, is there, it's basically, yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah, and that could be in an email, it could be what we're doing right now. It yeah. could, being expressed also is picking the fluorescent pink t-shirt, um, cooking and putting some weird ingredient in that you don't tell your family about. Um, you know, so being expressed doesn't necessarily mean that I'm singing or writing a song or writing a poem or whatever it is. But just that the energy is moving, and it's the energy that we talked about a few minutes ago, about having to be responsible not only for the energy moving, but f at, for the pace with which it moves. So for me, it moves so quickly that if I don't tend to it every day, it's kind of like eating. If I don't write, or if I don't chit-chat, <laughs> or if I don't listen, which is another form of art to me, or if I don't have some kind of connection going on, I, go, I spiral downward pretty quickly. Now, listening as a form of art, that mm -hmm. caught my attention uh -huh. uh, as someone who listens and You're loves to listen. You're amazing at it. No, but, wow. but you don't normally hear people talk about that as an art form. It, it seems is. expressed as coming out. How right. is listening a form of art? Well, I think the whole monological approach that North America sometimes can take is dangerous because there's really not a lot of connectivity going on in there. Yeah. So for me, dialogue and relationship, I'm obsessed with it. So listening is 50% of the equation. Yeah. And there is an art to it. You know it. Yeah. You're doing it right now. Yeah. I'm, expre <laughs> I'm expressing my listening. You are. I'm expressing it. Right. Yeah. But I don't think you would continue doing what you're doing if there wasn't some artistic payoff to yeah. being an amazing listener. Yeah. And, and for me, there is. I live to listen. And yeah. when I first moved to Los Angeles, culturally speaking, from Canada to America, it was actually quite shocking because I think there may be a perception that there aren't a ton of differences. But one of the differences was in Canada, everything is dependent upon dialogue and conversation, which is also part of the reason why I'm loving this right now. So when I moved to Los Angeles, everyone was sharing, and there was a lot of sending and a lot of monologisms, and, um, and I didn't speak for six months. Wow. And I met thousands of people, and I just thought, I have to become more American. I have to speak, and speak when it's not solicited. But there's a quality of listening that I enjoy speaking to, and when that quality's not there, I'd rather just watch people. Mm -hmm. You're listening to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. We welcome you to learn more about our collection of more than a thousand learning programs and receive two free gifts just for visiting us. Just go to soundstrue.com backslash free gifts. That's soundstrue.com backslash free gifts. And now back to Insights at the Edge. Now, this feeling of needing to be self-expressed, 
in whatever form it takes. Mm. I can imagine that many people, I can imagine, relate to that sense of something inside, that that's needed regularly, mm. or else something like a depression, deflation will happen. Mm. But yet that, for many of us, something keeps us held back. Mm. Some, some fear, uh, some sense of what if that secret ingredient I put in the you know, recipe that I'm making actually ruins it, so I won't. So a lot of holding back. And I'm curious what you would say to that person who's listening right now and says, yeah, I, I see myself hold back all the time. How can Alanis help that person, potentially? Well, first thing I would say if I had the privilege of sitting yeah. across one-on-one -on -one would be, well, tell me more about that. Yeah. What, what, are, what is the fear? Yeah. You know, is the fear that if I speak out, I might risk becoming successful, and then if I'm, I'm successful, I'll be lonely and isolated and sad? That's true. You will. No. no. I don't buy it. <laughs> well, I don't buy it now. I don't buy it. But, <laughs> no, but that's just one part of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but there's all, there's all kinds of other parts that are really, really, really fun about stepping out. And stepping out isn't just this one version. You know, for a long time, I would hear people say, step out and be huge. And, and that's just way too much pressure. What if one's vocational calling was really tiny? You know, nurses, teachers, doctors, mothers, you know. Why does everyone have to be Martin Luther King? Why do we all have to be Nelson Mandela? <laughs> and we love those people, <laughs> but we're all contributing in unique, different, varied ways on the whole range of what it is to serve. And so the private, quiet, tiny servings are so generous. And so if I were to be speaking with someone about what might hold them back yeah. from being expressed, um, I would just hold their hand, and not unlike what you just did with me, and say, what do you want to express? What do you love? What gets you going? If you had three days off and someone gave you $25 million to play with and you couldn't spend it on responsible things, what would you do? You know, and if some, someone might say, I might make cocktails, or I might, you know, I might garden. How many friends do I have who, want to, who are dying to garden? Garden! <laughs> You know, and there's this pressure that we put on ourselves, I think, in this era, as women especially, that our empowered feminine force has to show up as something huge. And I'm one to talk, because mine actually personally did show up as something huge, but my biggest moments and junctures and seminal moments for me have been very personal, and often alone, or with my husband, or with my son, or with my therapist. My team of therapists. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a village. It takes it's a village right. of therapists. <laughs> You're in Boulder. You're in a good Okay, good. Of you all have yeah. your teams. <laughs> it does take a team. <laughs> so here you are. You're talking to someone who might have a sense of being afraid, some 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 version of fear, and. Uh, I, one of the things I read, and you, it was, you were talking about uh, in runner's world about running marathons. Mm. And the interviewer asked you, uh, do you ever feel afraid before a marathon? Mm -hmm. And you said, I never let fear stop me. Mm -hmm. And that, I thought that was a strong statement. So yes, you, you, you had fear about the marathon that was coming up, but you wouldn't let the fear stop you. And I wonder if you can talk about that, how you, when you feel fear, how yeah. you relate to it? I feel fear all the time. I feel fear right now. I'm always anxious. I'm either anxious or depressed or happy or sort of floating in consciousness. <laughs> um, sometimes all in the span of a minute. Um, so I think there was an element of having had two brothers as a kid that made it so that I had to be counter counterintuitive with my fear or I was going to be left out. So I had to jump off that cliff. I had to go snowboarding. I had to run really, really quickly to get, you know, to catch up to them. And I wanted, I'm a connection girl, so I wanted to connect, so I was willing to push through fear. 
You know, so, so it started out maybe pathological, yeah. and then it turned into, wow, there's actually a huge payoff to, to stepping forward even in the face of fear, and being transparent around it. You know, like just saying, wow, okay, I'm really nervous, my mouth is dry, my neck is tense, getting really somatic and in the body, I can't feel my feet, they're cold, my hands are cold, and here I am. Could you think of any examples in your life where you have let fear stop you? I am a recovering codependent love addict, work addicted person. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I could say probably I've participated in the disassembling of relationships singularly based on fear nonstop. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, I, I think fear stops me a lot, but it, I'm counterintuitive enough with it that I have enough fun experiences. But there's fear always. Now, I've, I've done quite a bit of reading, as you can tell about <laughs> yeah. you, Anna. So you are Charlie that's Rose. Right, that's right. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I read, and, and correct me, of course, if any of this is wrong, sure. is that in, as part of your songwriting process, you'll actually look in your journals for the places of terror. Mm and find those nuggets of terror and go into them and pull them out mm. as a potential seed for a song. And yeah. I thought that was actually so interesting mm. and intelligent mm. because so often people, you know, if we're afraid of something, that's what we push away. Right. And here you are and you're using it as actually the seed of a creative process. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk about that. There's something about that visceral response of fear or, or anger or Love. So basically, passion writes songs for me. So I can be passionately terrified and I'll go right to that. Or, or um, a lot of unspoken things. Again, the Canadian cultural predisposition to not speaking often makes it for me to have felt liberated in the studio alone with my instruments to say exactly what I wanted to say. And the challenge became, how can I blend the so-called courage that I'm evidencing in this songwriting process and even in the performing of it I suppose on some level although there is there is I can hide behind sweaty glittery loud noisy things so there is still a protection in that but how can I blend the courage that I am applying in this the writing of these words to my day-to-day -day life because there really was a disparity for a long time and there still is so really the journey is about blending that courage mm -hmm. so that when people meet me they don't think wow, who's that girl versus this girl? And certainly they're all aspects of me, but, um, but the, cur or the invitation for me with my own art is to apply that courage. And the other thing I wanted to say about that as well was that there is a, an erroneous message, I think, out there that art and the process of creating is very, very healing and therapeutic. And I don't think it is. Mm. I, think it's, I think it's cathartic. It moves energy. But there are certain songs, one of which is You Ought to Know, where I s have sung that song countless times on stage. And if I were to run into that person right now, I would feel horrified. So it goes to say that in my mind, healing happens in relationship. Growth happens when we try on new behaviors because our partner asked us to do something different because we're driving them crazy. Healing happens when your partner changes a behavior in order to take care of some part of you that has been left alone. Mm -hmm. And so art, while it is beautiful and messy and sweaty and lovely and, and, and there is that element of the, the, the gratification of being expressed, it's, it has not always been healing for me unless there is a relationship in it. Hmm. Relationships for me are the healing balm. Maybe you can tell me a little bit more of what you mean by healing. Healing is the return to the original wholeness and original truth of what we are. That mm -hmm. innate goodness, the one thing that is not subject to dualism, the one thing in this funny little playground that is, called, that is life, that is not subject to being good or bad. For a long time, I've worked, I worked for many years with Debbie Ford and she's been a great teacher uh, for me throughout my life. So doing a ton of work where I would embrace all these aspects of self where I'm a murderer and I'm jealous and I'm envious and I'm hateful and I'm, you know, and then equally that I'm a vision and I'm kind and I'm an angel and I, you know, so I was working on all this and where I got stumped time and again was, was the good and the bad. So I could, I could embrace that I was, I could embrace that I was good 
Then when it came to, I have to embrace that I'm innately bad, I just couldn't do it. And I'm pretty open. Like when my friends yeah. are challenging me, I'll, I'm pretty open to taking feedback that is hard to hear. So you, you, you could embrace, just to make sure I'm tracking with yes, you, the yeah. idea that you're a murderer. Yeah. But the idea that you were innately bad. Or that bad. I murder us. Murder us. That I have, okay. that, I have that, that part of me that just wants to punch someone in the nuts. I have that in me. Okay. But I don't do it yet. But yeah. um, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't do it. But it's in me. And so the bad part was a little confusing. So okay. to speak to what you yeah. just posed, it's because it's not true. Yeah. There's no such thing as a bad seed in my mind. So that is the unembraceable one. That is the one part that is not subject to relativity, duality, and it is the cosmic consciousness. It is the truth of who we are. It is the life stream that courses through us. All these beautiful words that so many amazing teachers have shared over the years. Um, so how did that speak to what you just asked? What did you just ask? Because really what you're talking about is healing and what is healing. Right. Healing and, is returning to that. And that that doesn't happen for you only through your art, that your, the artistic process would not be sufficient for you to generate healing. No way. Um, I, fe I feel the connection with God. I feel, you know, for lack of a better term, like I'm channeling or that something's moving through me and that I'm just being used and all those beautiful definitions of creating art. Um, but the healing of the return to the essential core self of who we are, this, so there's the innate consciousness God part of us in my mind. There's the, you know, and Margaret Paul is here, beautiful teaching on inner bonding about God, the inner loving adult parent that we can develop as we mature and as we heal actually. And then the core essential self, the part that you've just always known you've wanted to be an esthetician since you were two. You know, or you've just always known that you, were, you, lo you loved cooking or that you loved skiing or that you loved building buildings. You know, and then this wounded child part. You know, so, so this core essential self, for me, my responsibility, and I'm, and I'm not always responsible around it, definitely not but attuning to that as best as I possibly can for it to lead me. You know, we can call it intuition, we can call it talking to my inner child, we can talk, we can talk about it being this essential self being expressed. So it's when all of these are in harmony, the connection with God, my connection with being expressed, being responsible for the energy, knowing the truth of my innate, eternal, impermanent goodness, knowing that we're in this wild playground that is really sensual and has a lot of pleasure and a lot of pain, and, and somehow have, being equanimous with that idea is, for me, healing. A lot of it has to do with touch in my particular story, too. Being held, we're in a society that if you touch each other, it's sexual harassment and you're being inappropriate. And yeah, of course, sometimes people are doing that. But a lot of times, we just want to put our hands on each other. <laughs> You know, and that I think is deeply healing on a cellular, neurobiological, biochemical, heart, soul level. Yeah. And fitting with your real uh, heart investment in healing in your own life and with this profound definition that you're offering, I know that you're quite involved in a movement that's called Relationship First. Yeah. And I wonder if you can <clears throat> talk what, what that is and why you're lending your energy to it. Yeah, it's, um, it's an organization that I co-founded with Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt, John, John and Julie Gottman, Dan Siegel and Carolyn, um, Diane Ackerman, and many others, Marianne Solomon. And basically, we all came together because we're obsessed with relationship. It's called relationshipsfirst.org. We're doing a soft launch at the end of the year. And... Um, the begged question is, what would happen if you put your relationships first? Hmm. And this also includes, in my mind, it includes colleagues. What if your relationship and the climate of your interactivity and the functionality of it in your work environment was more important than the bottom line? Mm -hmm. You know, what if, what if my marriage and what if my son, what if my friendships, which is a big one for me these days, what if they were the most important thing in my life? What would life look like? 
Mm-hmm. And I, I'm realizing that it just looks better and better the more I prioritize mm. that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, to me, that's the ultimate divine feminine approach. Mm-hmm. Honoring and, and nurturing and being an active participant, but even just an active protectress of my loved one's healing process. That the only reason I'm here is to heal, to support you in your healing and to actively participate in that. And you are going to tell me what that looks like. Because if I project onto you what I think you want, there's a level of self-absorption and narcissism and projection onto you. And my imagination is that you wouldn't feel very loved. Yeah. But that I would go by with what my loved ones ask of me, what they request of me. And if they're complaining and being really cruel, when, I'm, when I have my wits about me, I'll say, Where, is there a request? Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm in an argument with my husband, we're pretty quick to go, request? Yeah. <laughs> So that's basically how we do it. Have you had to change the way your life is structured with all of the demands and being the, the, the fabulous rock star to put relationships first? How, how have you actually done that in an operational way in your life? Uh, the good news about my lifestyle over the years is that it's been incredibly communal. So going on tour surrounded by 50 to 100 people, yeah. you know, although being a boss has, has an energetic of a tiny bit of separation. And, and the boundaries that are required to be an effective boss, I think, are really valuable. So I would tolerate a little bit of that separation for that reason, because it keeps the whole machine running really smoothly. But uh, communalism is huge to be around humans. Um, but how to prioritize relationship? I think I went after all the candy. You know, I went after the fame and the awards, and okay, now I got that, all right? Uh, now I'm going to be a marathon runner, and I did that for charity, and that's cool, and now I'm a charity person. That's awesome. But they, you know, I was just kept going and checking on the list all the things that I thought that if I did that or if I achieved that, it would give me peace, because ultimately I'm always just chasing peace. And then instead of spending all that time chasing the thing that will give me peace, there were actually ways for me to come from peace and relationship for me is the way to, to do that. I can't see parts of myself. You know, whether I was mirrored well in that stage of development in my life or not, doesn't matter. I can't see myself, and even a mirror isn't, doesn't help me enough. Even though Louise Hay, God bless you, I love the mirror work, and it does definitely bring the vibration up. I still need other. And there was this big movement in the, in the feminist movement totally understandably, of, you know, men went off to war, women stepped in, we can do everything men can do, maybe we can do it better, which is funny. Why? Um, And then, um, so that's awesome, and that was a a delightful and important link in the chain. But as Dr. Pat Allen says a lot, it brought, the feminist movement brought us maybe power, and it did bring us this sense of competence, but it didn't bring us love. And so it's this big... I think, dangerous movement of autonomy in the world. And so it really just separated us even more. I don't need anybody. I can do this on my own. I can, you know, but even therapy is relational. And even the therapeutic movement is moving more toward more disclosure on behalf of the therapist and more compassion and more connectivity versus just clipboard, lie down, I can't look at you. Which is also, I love analysis in that way. It's too really cool. But, um... I just want to tie that bow. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, so autonomy. Um, So the movement went into this autonomous place. Again, a very important link in the chain in my mind, but lonely and disconnective. And then now what's happening is that it's becoming hip again to be dependent. Not codependent, although, you know, we all have our wounds and they all show up in different ways, but interdependent and that it's okay to need each other. Of course we need each other. We need each other for touch and eye contact and love and sex and food and care and concern and interest and conversation. And so, so how can relationship not be important to me? I don't think I would be alive if I just kept going down the trajectory of, of wanting to grab all the brass rings and eat them. <laughs> that, it, it becomes uh, hollow and a lot of people were upset when I would say that because they didn't want to hear it because they were still on the ambitious 
journey. They didn't want me to be sharing anything disillusioning for them. Yeah. So I did start shutting up around that a little bit. Well, you, you have this quote here about being famous, and, and you say, only traumatized people want to be famous. It won't raise your self-esteem. It won't create profound connection. It's not going to heal your childhood traumas. You're going to be subject to a lot of criticism and praise, both of which are violent in their own ways. Amen. <laughs> I did think as I read that, uh, how is it that praise, how did you, I mean, I know you said you're a very sensitive person, mm -hmm. but how is praise something you experience as a type of violence? Well, there's praise projecting of the light qualities onto me to the point where sometimes I don't feel seen. And then what I would do with a lot of unsolicited feedback is that I would say, is, does this feel accurate? So if I would read something that said I looked like the elephant man, which I did um, on stage, hopefully not right now, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because I've done my work. <laughs> Not. I haven't. <laughs> so I would just say, if it hurts, if what I read hurts, I would say, what is it about this thing that is being spoken about around me that, that hurts? It could be that it's some aspect of me that I've fragmented off and I don't want to think about. So I'll do some integrative work around that. It could also just hurt because it it, it feels like I'm being missed, and, uh, and being mirrored as a child, I think, is such a big deal when we can look at the children and say, yes, you are Spider-Man. Yes, you are so strong, so big. You know, all of that stuff is so huge. Um, and I've spent, you know, 30 years trying to figure out that I actually exist. And I heard Gangaji talk about that once, where, and I don't even know it's the, if it's the same example that we're talking about, but this sense of floating, you know, that I don't know on a certain spiritual level, it's, it actually is a portal into the spiritual approach because that floating non-identity thing is what a lot of us aspire to in the spiritual journey. The unfortunate part is that the psychological egoic part is actually important for me to have fleshed out enough to be able to interact in the world. So it made for some trouble in that area. Mm -hmm. And I don't know... If yeah, that's well, speaking but, to it. You know, one of the things that we were talking about uh, last night had to do, and I think it's related to this topic of praise and blame, oh, which yeah, is yeah, your experience guys. of people's envy mm. and how terribly painful you experience mm. that. And I'd be curious if you could talk about that, but also what you might say to people who have a moment where they do feel envious. Like they might feel envious of some, something, someone they've seen on stage here at Emerging Women. I wish I, wish I had that. I wish I could that's, talk like that, dance it. like that, that's or whatever. That's not envy, though. That's not, what is that? That's jealousy, which is precious. Oh. I think jealousy is precious. I'm jealous all the time. And then Debbie Ford, sweet woman, basically said, take whatever you're jealous about, write it down, <laughs> and, and just foster that in your own life. So if someone likes my hair, just go get the shiny product and put it in your hair and don't worry about it. You know, so, and my, <laughs> I mean, you know, just wear a wig. Um, but I think jealousy is sweet because it also, it shows us a part of ourselves that we want to have take form. It's precious. Envy, on the other hand, is hate. And it wants to spoil and kill and hurt and make it go away. And that hurts. So have fun with jealousy and just make it work for you. You know, when I'm jealous of someone, if I, you know, if I see something that someone's doing or something someone cooked or something, I'm just like, oh, I want to make that cookbook. You know, I'll just say, well, then go make a cookbook. Let's do it. You know? <laughs> but if I, I'm trying to think about my own hostility and my own hate. Well, that's another conversation altogether. I'll write about it in a song. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, I think that distinction is really important because there's a lot of shame. I, feel, I have felt shame over the years when I've been jealous of people. Yeah. But it's because I couldn't make my jealousy work for me yet. Yeah. And once it started working for me, I was like, oh, this is great. But the danger in relationships, and I've had some challenge around this, is when that hostility and that hate 
is just being hurtled toward me a lot. And it definitely hurts because it's the ultimate disconnect. I mean, hate is the opposite of connectivity, so. Yeah. And it's also an illusion. So that beautiful quality, I don't know, it might have been Thich Nhat Hanh that talked about that beautiful quality of being really, really happy for another. It was Jack Cornfield the other day. He spoke with Dan Siegel at UCLA. He was just talking about that beautiful quality of, of being happy for another. And he probably had a couple of really gorgeous words that he used to illustrate it. But that quality really requires, if I'm going to be happy for your success, there has to be a connection here. And so when that hostility and that envy happens, there's a big fragment, there's a big trauma. And that quality of inquiry that you seem to live by so gorgeously, and, and I, I just love inquiry, I love curiosity. It's the antidote to violence to me. When there's some violence here, when I, if I can just shift the mechanism a tiny bit to get curious, everything changes. It gets really loving and warm and feminine and soft and quite wise, too, because all these parts that are really angry and really violent have so much to say. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now, there's a, a word that I heard you introduce in describing how you like to talk to people who are, quote unquote, ceilingless, <laughs> ceilingless. Ceilingless. And that's an interesting word. And I'm, I'm curious what you mean by ceilingless and how you experience that both in yourself and in other people. It's very selfish, basically. I love the quality of, of this between that is between us. You know, it's mm -hmm. like there's been a lot of talk about joining the conversation or starting the conversation or catapulting the conversation. And so for me, the conversation is serpentine, so it can go into psychology, then it can go into nail polish, then it can go into, uh, then it can go into conflict with partner, then it can go into consciousness, then it can go into what was Timothy Leary talking about, then it can go into you know, and, and it it just goes all over the place. And when I reach someone's ceiling, perhaps it's their capacity for intimacy gets smacked, uh -huh. or their capacity for vulnerability gets smacked, yeah. or. Sometimes it's intellectualism. Sometimes it's, you know, Howard Gardner talks about the nine intelligences. Sometimes I just meet someone who isn't really that interested in talking about that particular, or, you know, calling upon that particular form of intelligence. So we'll hit a ceiling. So when I have an interaction with people where there's a ceilinglessness, I'm totally in love. I'm just like, I just want to put my pajamas on and sleep on the floor right there. Yeah. Well, we're uh, removing the ceiling <laughs> from this room right now, to, invisibly. I want to circle back to your songwriting process. And you've mentioned in several interviews, 30 to 40 minutes, the song just comes out. And here today, you talked about, you used the word channeling. Mm -hmm. It's a type of channeling process for you. And yeah. whatever people think of the word, what I'm curious <laughs> about is what's going on for you. And if something's coming through, do you have a sense that you're connected to a being, just the mystery as a whole? What's happening? What's your, what's your understanding of that process? Um, sometimes it's a spirit guide, but when it's music, it's just, it's almost like these faculties and these gifts, these God-given gifts that I was given are just being used by the life force. And it's careening through and these words, because I love the English language and I slaughter it sometimes and I malapropism myself all over the place, but I love words, I love making up words. And so that faculty or that capacity is being used. Howard Gardner calls it, calls it the linguistic intelligence. So I'm just having that part used, I'm not unlike scientists and dancers, you know, and pole vaulters. They just have that talent and sometimes they're beleaguered by their own talent. You know, and, and everyone in this room has one or 20 talents. Geminis, for some reason, when I talk to Geminis, they have so many, they're just bothered by them. <laughs> Any Geminis in here? <laughs> Is that your experience? Yeah. Oh, it bothers me all the time. I'm just like, it's over option paralysis sometimes. And not to say that we're, you know, the greatest fill in the blank of all time, but it's multiple talent, multiple hyphenate, all of it. 
And so you asked a second ago. What, what, what you might be channeling, what or okay. who, or what that process is like. And yeah. What's it feel like in your body? A that's song, a a song is about to come. I mean, each of these songs, 30 to 40 minutes, that's it. I mean, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly <clears throat> non-conceptually delivered. Very well, non-conceptually, but it is siphoned through the intellect. Yeah. So there's something to be said for that. It's not unlike, I think we all know what it is to have this energy channel through us. It's like writing an email. I just got to send this quick email, I'll be right out. That's what it feels like. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. Is that, you know what it's like to set to write a really quick email? Yeah, I do. That's, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> so it's that feeling. It's, it's awe. I feel awe when I hear that. It's just awesome. Cool. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no. I think that way when I see people draw, you know, I have so many talents. I have so many non-talents that when I see other people have them, I have that. So that's yeah. why I just said it's great, because yeah. I understand. And um, you said, what does it feel like in the body? Yeah. It's pretty stressful. It's not my favorite thing. I don't like writing. Huh. I'd much rather just eat a sandwich and go watch a movie. <laughs> and sometimes I do. But I'm writing a book right now, and that is just awful. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, it's the worst. But when a song is a, uh, when a song slash email is about to come through you, yeah. do you do you have a, a sense of like you know so like kind of like I need to go to the bathroom or I need it's like something's about to happen here? There's a mo you know. Is there yes. Some well, that that's every day, and that's when I don't do it, I get depressed. But I don't always do it. So what I like to do is I like to have discipline and inspiration meet halfway. So sometimes yes, am I the girl writing stuff at four in the morning on my iPhone or a little piece of paper? Yes, of, of course. Um, but what I'll do is I'll structure it. So with the record writing, I'll ask my collaborator or my producer, or I'll set up studio time from 1 p.m. till f once my son was born, I basically built a, a mini studio in, in my home yeah. uh, so that I could breastfeed and write and go back and forth, um, sometimes at the same time. Um, but I, what was I just saying there? Discipline, thanks. The combination, and, and you talk about this actually as a masculine and feminine combination. Yeah, the, the, of both the sides of the process. brain too, yeah. right? Just going back between both so sides. So I love the structure that you use. Yes, so the yeah. structure is 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. every day for music. Sometimes I stay as late as seven, especially when it's in my own home, because it's yeah. just fun. Um, book writing for me is five days a week. I do the sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, administrative, empire running work yeah. from 1 till 2.30 every day, or 12 to 2.30. I work out in the morning, I hang out with my family in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then from 2.30, nope, from 3 p.m. till 6 or 7, I write. Hmm. And, uh, and then I'm off, and I play with my son and hang out with my family. So your son is now almost three, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when he was five months old, this is when you decided to make this most recent record to start the process? Yes. What was going on for you? I mean, here you're a new mom, relationship first. Why the big push to make a new record? And how did you know that it was trustworthy and not something that was some type of uh, work addiction or something like that? Well, was it probably a combination of work addiction and ego? Probably 20% was that. The other element was that I had postpartum depression. And so the only time I'd ever had depression was when I wasn't writing or working out or sleeping properly. Or I was in a breakup. <laughs> so I thought, well, one way to address this might be to just write a record. Also, I had a lot of journals full, so I'll go through um, rhythms. And Eckhart Tolle talks about this, so sweet. He talks about that, you know, certain times where you go away in that ebb and then the flow comes up. And so I call it the under the rock time. Yeah. 
And uh, I can't spend too many years there because then I start feeling, you know, you just said, do you feel like you have to go pee? Yeah. For me, it just feels like I have to throw up. Like there's just so much to say and I'll see things going on around me. Also, there is this added element where when I'm at Whole Foods or some restaurant somewhere and people's perception of me, and this is the image conscious two, three, four part of the Enneagram. I hate to admit that I'm pretty image conscious, but I am. And, and for a pointed reason, actually, because I'm very agenda around serving. So when I'm out in the world and there's misperceptions about what I'm dwelling in based on the fact, understandably, that the last record they heard was four years ago, there's this part of my, what I call the positive part of my ego that is like, update, we gotta start writing songs about what's happening now so that when I go out in the world and someone stops me in the street and they wanna talk about content, I can go, oh yeah. And it's, it's topical and palatable and, and um, immediate. It's in real time. So there is an element of my wanting to catch up to real time. To, I wanted to pull out of my depression. It was also just time. I had tons of journals full. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also I had these intentions when I was pregnant of finishing the book and finishing the record and I did neither because by 4 p.m. every day I couldn't move. Yeah. So I had to push it all till later. And also this terror, I think part of the postpartum depression for me had a lot to do with being a career woman and how much of an about face my whole life experienced. You know, I went from being on airplanes nonstop to traveling to, to talking to interviews to radio shows to rock shows to South America. Blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it was like, I'm home. And I didn't have that sense of community that I now know is so vital and so important to have gather around you. You need your women, you need your loved ones around you. And I didn't even know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to invite that. So it was a huge exercise in receptivity and learning how to be taken care of. Because my role in my family was the therapist and to take care of everybody. And I just kept doing that over and over again. So well, and here you are also modeling that in the first year of your child's life, you did both. You, you mm -hmm. were a mom and an attachment parenting mom, and you, you made a new record. Yeah, it yeah. was so great to, yeah. to be able to do it. And it also just required coffee. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Alanis, so I'm going to ask you uh, one last question. Oh, Final great. question. Okay, great. Yeah. Are Which we going to talk with everybody or no? No, okay, this great. is it. We're That's wrapping it up. Okay, great. It's been very intimate. Oh, yeah. With all of us here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has. Here at Emerging Women, we've been exploring from many different perspectives where we are as women. You could say in the feminist movement today, where we've come from, mm. and potentially where we might need to go now. Mm. What's next? for us. And what I'm curious to know is the Alanis Morissette feminist agenda going forward. Oh no. What do you see? Um, I touched on it a few minutes ago, the beginning part where it was very much about women proving their competence and, and their capacity to do and take action. It's to me, and that's just obvious now, especially to our generation, I feel like it's obvious that we can. Where we're going now is, is for us to cultivate and integrate both sides of the brain, both sides of the masculine, feminine, yin, yang. Let the whole spectrum be available to us. Um, and then for the feminine, the divine feminine to lead the charge so that the masculine and the feminine qualities in all of us would bow down to the feminine agenda, which is inherently connective, and that the divine masculine would provide and protect this feminine agenda, which is the sacred union, which is what we're moving toward. Yeah. You know, and that eventually the feminist movement will slowly fall away and it'll become this sacred union, and it'll become a no-brainer for us, this androgynous, multitudinous, r huge range of masculine, feminine, yin-yang will be embodied in our day-to-day -day life, and we'll call upon whatever aspect we need to. So God bless the feminist movement, because where we were in the patriarchy has been so violent and so oppressive and so fucking painful that where we're going sounds so much better to me, mm -hmm. for men and women alike.
Did I get off? <laughs> I said to Alanis when I first met her that I experienced her. Uh, I didn't write you a song, but I wrote you an email. Uh, and the email said, you know, basically, you're a glitter bomb. And that's how, that's how I experienced this person. And so I'm so happy that the uh, glitter bomb exploded uh, right here at the St. Julian with all of us. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.